Hi, good day, good afternoon, good morning. I'm James McLeod, FINOS Director of Community, and I'm your host for today's call. Um, so being the host, um, it means that I'm actually looking after everybody who's on the call, including Enrico, who's um, presented for today. And so if I can ask everybody who's joining us um, just to place yourselves on mute, um, that would be great because it means that we can keep um, any background noise down. Um, or if you're unable to mute yourself, um, I can do that as host. I would like to welcome everybody to our first FINOS meetup um, of 2021. And I'm James McLeod, uh, FINOS Director of Community, and I'm joined by Enrico Trentin, um, Development Relations Lead at Diff Blue, who are a FINOS member. Um, and Enrico's here to uh, present to us today the code coverage paradox where 90% isn't enough, but less might be. But before I hand over to Enrico um, for his presentation, I'd like to remind everybody to visit um, FINOS at finos.org to subscribe to our mailing lists and learn how to get involved with the FINOS community. Um, I'd also um, encourage developers and engineers to visit the FINOS organization on GitHub um, by visiting github.com forward slash FINOS. If you're an engineer or developer wanting to contribute or leverage FINOS open source projects. Um, plus also uh, for anybody who's registered for today's call, um, we'll also be drawing a couple of attendees um, out of our out of the hat um, randomly um, and uh, shipping you um, a FINOS t-shirt each as well, which is great. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Enrico to today's um, meetup. It's over to you. Thanks, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm Enrico Trentin. I'm the Developer Relations Lead here at DiffBlue. We're a spin-out from Oxford University, founded in 2016 with Series A founding led by Sachs. We're a silver member of Finos and provide the full version of our product, BlueCover, for free to use on Finos projects. We build tools that use eight techniques to automatically generate unit for your Java application. More on this. In this talk, I'm going to give you an overview on software metrics and how they can be used to minimize risk and increase the quality of an application. I will start with coverage, and as the title suggests, I will explore its strengths and weaknesses, and I'll show you why coverage alone is not enough to assess the risk in your application. I will then introduce other metrics that can be used in conjunction with coverage so that I have a more complete set of tools for a risk assessment. Finally, I will talk about Diff Blue Cover, what it is, and the part it can play in the reduction of risks. Let's start with an example. In this chart, using the code coverage of my product. We're all familiar with coverage, it's that percentage that tells us how much our application has been tested. And frankly, we all get obsessed with percentages sometimes, and they end up being the only indicator we look at. And you can see the coverage of this pro project is impressive. It reaches 90%. And those of you that work in a company where coverage target exists, uh, know how much time and resources it takes to reach these levels. However, once I hit this number, is my work done? Am I now confident that the risk of this application is low only by looking at this 90%? Or perhaps some of working with legacy code and ha which hasn't been sufficiently tested and are working on improving its coverage. Do I need to reach 90% before I start feeling safe? In order to find the answer to these questions, I need to have a closer look at my application and at its tests. Ultimately, how am I to doubt if this 90% of coverage is necessary, it effectively catches regressions and increases quality? Let's start by having a look at some of the code that has been covered. In this, we're still looking at the application from my previous example, but I have zoomed in on one specific class and its methods. The coverage of this class is 100%, but when I look at the method names, I notice they're all getters and setters plus the class constructor. For those of you not familiar with the concept, 
These are very common methods that tend to be very short, most of the time just one line, and they contain no logic. And at diff blue, we call this trivial methods. In other words, this class and its methods are not contributing any significant risk for my application. Writing tests for these methods is not a good use of developer's time, and clearly testing this methods increases the code, uh, code coverage, so it makes us feel better, but this does not decrease the risk in my application in any significant way. What that has been covered and does contain logic. Here's an example of a cloud that I called calculator. It has a single method called divide. And as you may expect, given two numbers, it returns the numerator divided by the denominator. And here is the unit test, very simple. It just checks that dividing one by one results in one. The class calculator has 100% coverage. We have tested every line of the code, but clearly the risk isn't mitigated and my application is not 100% safe from failure. I haven't tested, for example, what happens if I divide by zero. If I try and divide by zero, my application will throw an exception. And if that's not handled, my application will crash. In the worst case, I may even lose important information being processed by my application. In this case, 100% coverage did not protect me from failure. And finally, let's have a look at code that hasn't been covered. Just because 90% of the code has been tested, it doesn't mean that a failure cannot happen in the remaining 10%. It just takes a bug in a single line to potentially cause destructive damage. Let's see an example. I focus on one untested piece of code and I have some information about it. It was written a long time ago. Its software may even have left the company. It hasn't been touched in nine years. I can see that the class is bigger than the average. And I had a look inside and I saw it was pretty complex. So what is this piece of code? It is the function that restores backups after a failure. It is critical for my application. It's only used in case of emergency. So we don't need this functionality very often, but when we do, we cannot afford a failure. It must work and it must work properly. So in this case, coverage has been helpful. Uh, it has been pointing to the class connected to the highest risk. My mistake was that I stopped at the headline figure 90% and I haven't looked at the breakdown by classes and methods. So as we've seen, coverage gives us some information about our project and can guide us towards the riskiest part of our code base. But coverage needs to be inspected closely and is still not enough to protect us from failures. So what can I do to mitigate the risk of failure in my project? It all boils down to having a deeper understanding of the code. And there are a lot of other metrics that can help us with that. I have selected four popular metrics that together with coverage can complete the picture and provide enough information for me to spot the risks in my code. I will talk about each one of them in the next few slides, but I want you to keep in mind that none of these metrics on its own is the solution to all of my problems. And it's by using them together that I build up more and more confidence in my piece of software. The first metric I want to suggest is testability. Sometimes the reason for a lack of coverage in an area of my code base is that my code is not testable. Perhaps um, I'm writing a test for a specific piece of code, but I cannot access all of it. And this makes it impossible for me to verify the behavior of my code with unit tests. The situation I just described could be called poor testability. In the context of unit tests, a method is testable when I can fully control its inputs and fully observe its effects. If you're working on increasing the coverage of a project and you're struggling to write tests for a specific method or class, double check the testability of the source code. 
Sometimes the solution to reduce risk involves a refactoring of the code to increase the testability. Here I have an example of a method with pool testability. As you can see, the method increment modifies a private attribute of the class counter and does not return any value. When I try and write a test for this method, I realize that I have no way of checking the new value of the private attribute counter. A simple refactoring that improves the testability of this code involves adding a method that returns the private attribute counter. And after that, I can successfully test that the value has been inc incremented as, as expected. The next metric is cyclomatic complexity. It's a metric that quantifies how complex my code is. Here's an example of a piece of code and every piece of code can be represented by a diagram like the one that I've drawn on the right. Every blue node represents a set of instructions and every yellow node represents a decision point. The formula for calculating this metric is simple and as shown in the slide, the complexity for this piece of code is three. The higher the complexity for a piece of code, the higher the risk of making mistakes. In order to reduce risk, we want to keep the complexity low. Let's check once again the project that I've been using as an example at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, this time the colors are expressing the complexity of each part of my project. Here this metric is highlighting classes and methods with medium complexity and really pointing at four methods where the complexity is high. In order to reduce the risk, I have to make sure that these methods are well tested. Alternatively, by breaking down a complex method into multiple smaller units of functionality, we reduce the complexity, making it easier to test the code and thus help reduce risk. And different sources suggest different thresholds, but if the complexity of a piece of code exceeds 15, I'd strongly consider refactoring. Another technique to determine risks connected to a piece of software is analyzing the dependencies between classes. In the chart in this slide, each circle represents a class and dependencies between classes are represented by arrows. When I have multiple classes depending on the correct behavior of a single class, like for example, the green circle in the middle of this graphic, then I can say that the risk of that class is high because a single failure there can cause multiple errors in the rest of my application. In order to mitigate the risk in this case, I want to make sure that classes that are highly dependent on are well tested. And I have a warning here, pieces of code that are not depended on by others are not necessarily less critical. I should avoid testing, I should not avoid testing code just because no other part of my application depends on it. If you remember the example that I gave with the function that restores backup after a failure, you can immediately see how it applies here. The main purpose of unit tests is to identify incorrect behaviors of my code or regressions. Mutation testing is a technique um, that verifies the ability of your test to catch these mistakes. It consists of changing your source code by introducing mutations. These mutations should result in failures in your tests. If a test does not fail and retur returns a false positive, this means that the tests are of poor quality and are not a good indicator of the correct behavior of the application. Let's see an example. Here I have again my divide method. We could add a mutation by changing the division operator to multiplication. And now the method divide multiplies, which is definitely not the expected behavior. So I need my tests to tell me that a regression has been introduced. 
But looking at the test, I can see that what happens is one is multiplied by one, the result is still one, the test passes, and the regression has me caught. There are tools available for the most pro popular programming languages. Here, for example, I'm using PIT test. They can automatically introduce mutations, run the tests, and check that your tests are actually catching regressions. And last, I have a suggestion on how to use time more efficiently when writing unit tests. I already mentioned trivial methods. This pieces of code with very little risk connected to them. The problem with writing tests for trivial method is that they create a lot of noise unnecessarily, in addition to costing time and resources. In my example, there are 97 methods, 31 of which are trivial. I can still achieve coverage by testing them indirectly. What I mean by that is that these trivial methods are typically invoked from other classes, and by testing these classes, all my trivial methods can be effectively covered without having to spend additional time writing tests for each trivial method. We've seen how each one of these metrics can add to my understanding of the project and can point me in the right direction to identify and mitigate risk, but what happens once I'm done and the risk in my project is low? Software projects are changing all the time. New features are added, some libraries or dependencies need to be updated, and keeping on top of all these changes and writing new tests and adjusting the, the existing ones is a lot of work. Or perhaps you realize that your project does not have enough tests and you're organizing with your team to work on it. Um, Diff Blue Cover automates unit test generation and maintenance for Java projects and is available for free for use on Finos open source projects. Diff Blue Cover uses AI techniques to produce valuable tests that appear exactly like tests a human would write. We find the pathways through your code, simulate real world inputs, and generate tests that describe the current behavior of your code. We also generate detailed reports that show you the potential risks, as we've discussed in this talk. There are several ways to use it. There is a command line version that can be run from your terminal, or it can be scripted and used inside any CI pipeline so that every time new code is committed to a repository, Cover can generate and maintain the unit tests for you automatically. And if Look Cover is also available as a plugin for IntelliJ, and it's incredibly easy to install and use. Now let's have a look at a sample test. Here we have a test generated by DiffBlueCover that for a class that uploads documents to the AWS cloud. It's really important that developers can open this test and immediately understand exactly what's going on. They don't have time to decipher garbage tests. And as you can see, this test is very readable. If Bluecover creates a mock for the Amazon S3 client, initialize the objects needed for the tests, defines the behavior of the mock, and then goes on to creating all the necessary assertions to exercise the behavior of the method. We can also see that upload file to bucket has some string parameters, and we don't just use strings like foo and bar or null values. We use reinforcement learning techniques to, to determine valid inputs and ensure that they are appropriately human readable. So we've seen that the coverage, where the coverage falls short and that by using multiple metrics together, we can achieve a better understanding of the code, starting from the parts of our applications that we haven't covered, inspecting issues with the stability, making sure that the most complex parts of my code, as well as the most depended on, are well tested, and using mutation score to verify the quality of our tests. 
By doing this, we're able to identify risks in our code and mitigate it. We've seen how Decover can automatically generate, generate unit tests for you and how it can guide you to improve your project's testability. I know there are a few minutes for questions. Um, if there's anything else you want to ask me in the next few days, or if you want just to have a chat, feel free to send me an email to enrico.trentin at diffblue.com. And you can get started with Diff Blue Cover for Finos projects by visiting diff.blue slash Finos. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question you may have. Enrico, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it was extremely insightful. Thank you. And the, we do actually have a couple of um, questions. Um, the first coming from Ross Rhodes, um, who asks, it sounds like, um, sorry, my questions have just refreshed. It sounds like Diff Blue Cover is tailored specifically to Java. Any plans to broaden horizons to say Python? Right. Um, yes, it is true. Diff Blue Cover is tailored for Java, and um, we kind of have a roadmap for expanding to other languages, but um, we haven't published it yet. Python is particularly, it's quite different from Java, so it's not at the top of our list, I must say. <laughs> um, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Um, and uh, Manus also asked, um, does Diffly work for Android Java 2? Um, so um, Diffblue, Diffblue Cover reads um, Java bytecode. And as long as uh, the language used, for example, Kotlin uh, generates Java bytecode, then Diffblue Cover can read it, interpret it, and generate tests. But of course, the tests, at least right now, they are they are generated in Java. So this is this is the catch. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, there is a roadmap that that involves having uh, expanding to other languages in the future. But we are not quite there yet. Right. Awesome. Um, before I ask any um, further questions, I'd like to actually announce um, the Finos T-shirt winners for people who are on the call right now. So um, the, the people behind the scenes have actually picked two people from random um, who registered for the event. And I'm pleased to say that Parvis Aravi from Intel um, and Robin Wise from Fidelity um, will both be shipped um, Finos t-shirts um, from the Finos team. Um, and so no doubt um, somebody will be in contact um, with you in order to get your address. Okay, Amico, if it's okay with you, I've got another question to ask. And if um, uh, people would also like to ask their questions in chat as well, um, we've got a few minutes um, left in the Q&A. So feel free to, to ping your, your questions in chat. Um, can I ask the question, is there anything to be worried about when using AI to develop tests? Um, all right, well, yes. Um, AIs are less deterministic than traditional code. They use more advanced techniques. So we have to make sure that we can reproduce every time step by step and have a reliable result um, every time. Of course, at Diff Blue, we have put a lot of effort into uh, into making Diff Blue cover our product as reliable as it can possibly get. Um, yes, so I would say that this this is the main risk and and what we should be worried about. Talking about generic AI tools that can be used. Right, that's great. And um, Manas says, thank you for your answer in chat. Um, it's, um, it's our pleasure, Manas. Um, OK, so another question. If software is developed by multiple engineers, how do you ensure test cover is in place where different areas of the product interact? All right, if we are talking about uh, dependencies and how um, uh, one object uses another, let's say, for, for 
uh, object-oriented languages at least, unit tests can um, use each other each other's code for different parts of the application. So in this case, it would be covered. There are other cases, of course, in which uh, integration tests can help us um, testing the integration between different systems. Right, That's, thank you very much for answering that. And then finally, um, can developers evaluate DiffBlue software against their current projects? Of course. So if we're talking about um, Finos open source projects, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, DiffBlue Cover is, is free for you. And uh, here at diff.blue slash Finos, uh, you will find out how to, um, to reach us and, and see how you can start using uh, DiffBlue Cover. For other uh, open source projects, we have um, a community edition, which is free. It's a plugin for IntelliJ. Uh, you can find it in the IntelliJ marketplace and, and you can start using it right. That's brilliant. So thank you so much, Enrico, um, for your presentation, the code coverage paradox when 90% isn't enough, but less might be. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Enrico Trentin, uh, Development Relations relations lead from DiffBlue for joining us this afternoon and also remind everyone to visit finos.org to subscribe to our mailing lists um, where you'll also hear about um, other up and coming meetups as well um, and also if you're an engineer or a software developer feel free to head over to the finos organization at github.com um, forward slash finos uh, to contribute or leverage finos open source projects um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, Enrico, for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.